So good stuff. Now, um, we're going to move on uh, to one of our last presentations today. We've got the wonderful Clive Bowes with us from the Pest Management Consultancy. And we're going to be, or Clive's going to be talking about new and emerging UK pest species. So something that we, we, we do talk about every now and then and is really important in terms of what things we might see out there um, and how to identify them and things like that. So Clive, without further ado, if you would like to show oneself, and um, yeah, tell us about these new and emerging UK pest species. Oh, I think you're on mute. Uh, let me take you off mute, Clive. There we okay, go. Okay, that should be okay now. Fabulous. Okay, share screen. On the That's full screen. That's working, yeah. Just get that. So hopefully you can see that okay. Fabulous. Okay, good. Uh, well, uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, my name's Clive Bowes, as, as Natalie said, and uh, I'm from the Pest Management Consultancy. And uh, for the next 20, 25 minutes or so, I I'm going to be talking about new and emerging pests that we are encountering or maybe will encounter in the UK. But when the BPCA first asked me to do this, I thought I uh, you know, might work through a little list of... Uh, you know, pests that were coming over the horizon. But in the end, I found I was getting a bit bored with doing it that way. So what I've decided to do is to look at the pests that we've got at the moment to see where those pests have come from. And hopefully that might help us understand where new pests might be coming from, might shed some more light on the problem. And uh, so it's not, this isn't a practical presentation. You don't need to take notes. It's not going to change, I don't think, the way you do pest control. So uh, sit back and um, hopefully you'll find it interesting, but I'll let you be the judge of that. So uh, th the way I decided to look at it was say, look, we've got all the pests that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got our core pests, uh, and I've split those up according to where, where they've come from. Uh, and starting at top left there, we've got a box that says native wildlife that's always been a pest. So those are pest species that are probably always been pests, and maybe always will, stuff like wasps, you know, that are native to the UK and, uh, and are uh, an annual problem. And then moving to box two, we've got pests that have only recently uh, assumed pest status. They used to be wildlife, but now they've become pests. We're gonna look at those. And then box three, as we go clockwise around there, we're going to look at released pests or escape pests. And so on. we're going to work our way around this wheel uh, over the course of the next 25 minutes or so, have a little chat about it and see what we think, see where we think our new pests might be coming from. So we're going to go back to box one, start with box one and have a look at that in a bit more detail. And this, as I said, this is, native UK species that have always been pests, probably always will. Uh, you know, they're a pest because, you know, their lifestyle and, and our lifestyle interact often in a negative sort of way. So the classic example would be a wasp. Uh, it, it's a native UK species. Uh, and obviously we come into contact with it uh, even 5,000 years ago when uh, Neolithic folk were gathering fruit or apples at this time of year. Doubtless they got stung. Doubtless they found the wasp as a pest, exactly the same uh, as we do now. And there will be other insects, other native UK insects in this category. House flies would fall in there. Uh, garden ants would be another one. You can imagine garden ants becoming a problem uh, in uh, you know farms and buildings and homes thousands of years ago, where people were storing food stuff and uh, and ants were getting involved in that. So there's this box, there's this box one. Is this a box that's gonna produce new pests in the future? Well, it's not. You know, this is a box that we can put behind us. You know, we're not gonna get any more native, long established pest species. But in addition to box one, we have got UK species that have become a problem recently. These are animals that formerly we'd have called wildlife. You know, perhaps 100 years ago or so, we'd have called them wildlife. If we lived in rural areas, we may have come across them. If we lived in cities, we wouldn't have done. But in recent decades, these animals have made a transition. They have adapted their behavior and perhaps their feeding habits. 
so that they can live in cities. And when they live in cities, naturally, they will come into contact with people. And some of those interactions will be negative interactions. You know, these are interactions that will end up with the animals being called pests. Uh, and the urban fox would be a, a classic example of this. You know, the urban fox used to live in the countryside and uh, maybe round about the time of the Second World War, they started to be seen in cities. And now, as you know, they are well established. Many major cities in the UK have foxes right in the centre where they cause problems with, with fouling, with digging up people's gardens, with uh, getting into rubbish. Uh, interacting with pets and so on. So, despite them being a moderately large carnivore, you know they have, you know, they've taken up home in our cities and survived very well. And, and gulls would be a, a, another example. You know, a number of gull species that formerly were only found on the coast now live and nest in uh, in city centres. So they've uh, adapted well to that. So, interesting transition and a recent transition. So this box, box number two of these recently moved pests, are we going to see more stuff appearing in these boxes? Well, I think almost certainly we will. Unlike box one, this is a box that's going to produce a lot of new pests. You know, cities are expanding all the time. Uh, we're seeing a lot of development in on greenfield sites. Uh, so there's the potential for pests, you know, that were formerly rural to get involved in ur urban areas. And we're not only building on, on agricultural land or greenfield areas, we're actively creating green spaces in urban areas. We're creating more parks and uh, areas for you know, uh, relaxation and so on within cities. We're also seeing an interest in wildlife, uh, sorry, an increase in wildlife protection. Um, you know, there are animals that we could uh, control if we needed to uh, decades ago, which are now protected. So we're going to see, uh, I suspect, a lot more of pests moving or animals moving from being background wildlife to becoming pests. Uh, animals such as badgers, you know, which are already living in some suburban areas and causing problems. We're seeing deer moving into urban uh, and certainly in suburban areas. Uh, some species of deer are introduced, but others, let's say, are, are native. Uh, and uh, another interesting one is the wood mouse. You know, the wood mouse, if you look at most textbooks on rodent, rodent problems or just pest control in general, you don't see the wood, mice, wood mouse listed, Apodemus I'm talking about here. But certainly in some local authorities, they're finding now that the main mouse species inside homes is the wood mouse. It appears to be making a transition relatively recently from being wildlife to being an indoor pest. and. Uh, we may also see longer lived birds, you know, such as corvids, crows, already living in urban areas, but becoming more of a problem as they adapt to an, an urban, wild, uh, urban lifestyle. Uh, and if we look uh, sort of further afield, I don't know if any of you watched David Attenborough's most recent Life on Earth series, but he had one, uh, one of the programmes was on urban wildlife. Uh, and, and what was interesting was the, you know, the breadth of the species that were becoming urban problems in some areas. In India, leopards had moved from being a rural wildlife uh, animal to living in some parks, even in the centre of large cities, and uh, you know, making a living preying on animals, uh, you know, farmed or back garden or pet animals, even in the cities. And in Africa, he had footage of hippos moving into suburban areas and all feed on the lush, green, watered vegetation, irrigated vegetation in gardens and parks and so on. So obviously, we're not going to get leopards and we're not going to get hippos in the UK, but it shows the extent to which large mammals or large animals can adapt to living in urban areas. So I would say, watch that space, but let's move on. So that's box two. What have we got in box three? Box three, we've got those pests that were accidentally or maybe in the UK. Uh, and there's a bunch of things here. Uh, the grey squirrel would be a classic one. Uh, the grey squirrel was released in the UK in Victorian times, so a bit over 100 years ago, but it's now very widespread, as you know. Two main problems with it. One is when it comes into buildings and lives in roofs and damages what, uh, wiring uh, and so on. Uh, making it a major pest, uh, and, it, and also 
is had a, an ecological impact by displacing the less robust native red squirrel. So gray squirrel, classic introduced species. Uh, the Canada goose on the right hand side, there would be another one. Uh, you know, that's been around loose in the UK for well over a century, maybe close to two centuries, and creates problems through uh, driving out native waterfowl, but also just muddying and fouling parks and, and other areas and so on. In the picture, we've got the wild boar. If you live near the Forest of Dean uh, and, and a few other areas in the UK too, you'll know that escaped wild boar are now a challenge in those areas and, and people are concerned to know how to deal with. Uh, and there's a bunch of others we could go through as well. The American mink, uh, as you know, has had a major wildlife impact to the escape from fur farms in the UK and has impacted on uh, water voles in particular, parakeets in London, um, and more widely in the home counties, have, de have an ecological impact on native whole nesting birds, uh, such as uh, blue tits and great tits and starlings and so on. Uh, the, co the koi pew would be another good one to put in here, uh, a a another animal that was farmed for its fur, but escaped and uh, in the end was eventually eradicated. And that is a story probably for another day. Uh, uh, and, and finally, I'll just show you here at bottom, bottom left, we've got the Harlequin ladybird, which was deliberately released in mainland Europe as a biocontrol agent in uh, glass houses, control pests in glass houses, but not surprisingly escaped from the glass houses and spread and across the channel and now is widespread in the UK. And as you know, is having an impact on native um, uh, ladybird species. Uh, of course, releasing animals for the last 40 years has been prohibited under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. That's why we can't release a gray squirrel if we catch it in a live trap, as you know. Uh, I kind of hope that we won't see much more of this. Uh, you know. Hopefully, most people are aware now of the risks of releasing uh, non-native species uh, into the UK. Uh, and even when non-native species are farmed for meat or, or whatever, then there's strict enough uh, regulations around the enclosure of those animals so that the fences don't fall down and the animals escape and so on. So I'm going to hope that we're not going to see much more of this. What we're dealing with is inherited problems from earlier times when people were kind of laxer about releasing uh, non-native species into this country. Okay, there's that. Let's move on to, to box four, which is the, you know, when you start to learn pest control, uh, you get given this list of classic indoor pests that have come from warmer countries, the pharaoh's ants, the mill moths, the German cockroaches and so on. And, and, and most of these pests were brought here in Victorian times, uh, you know, at the time of the British Empire, when we had our colonies, and there was, you know, very extensive trade in goods from British colonies around the world, uh, uh, colonies that were basically warm country places and, and had these vari a variety of semi-tropical and tropical pests there that were associated with humans. They were brought in shipping and got established in the UK. And so most of these pests have been here over a century and, uh, you know, and they've become established as they're going to get, you know, as much as they are. They had a boost when central heating became more widespread, perhaps in the middle of the last century. And, you know, after the Second World War, uh, many homes had central heating fitted and, and pharaoh's ants and German cockroaches and so on became more widespread at that time. So these are pests that came in then. There was others that came with them as well, of course. Uh, we could look at, for example, flower beetles. Tribolium would have come in at that time, or Eziphilis would have come in. Other cockroach species, the American uh, oriental cockroach, would all have come in in Victorian times. And uh, so are we going to get any more pests coming via this route? Uh, you know, my feeling is we probably won't. Um, you know, trade has been going on with warmer countries with a wide variety of goods for a century, two centuries or more. And whatever could have come is probably here already. But as usual, there's always a however about this. Uh, and I just wanted to flag up for you the uh, 
the long-tailed silverfish that's sometimes called the paper fish, sometimes called the gray silverfish. Um, this is a pest, this is a curious one really, because it's quite widespread around the world. It's been carried around the world by trade and shipping or whatever uh, for many, many, many years. Uh, it, you know, I, I, but it only was, it was first recorded in the UK six or seven years ago. So really not long at all. And for some reason, either it never found its way to the UK uh, or maybe it was here all the time and we never spotted it. So th this I'm going to say, I'm not going to say it's the very last of the box four species, but it's going to be one of the last. It's plugging a gap that, you know, strangely has existed for a long time. and It's here now. It's plugged that gap. It's quite an interesting silverfish in, in some ways because we've got our native silverfish, as you know, that lives in slightly damp areas. You'll find it in uh, sort of ground floor kitchens and ground floor bathrooms and maybe even cellars where it's a bit damp and, you know, perhaps the damp course isn't, isn't as good as it should be. This species is much more tolerant of dry conditions. So it will live on upper floors in buildings. It will live in offices and living rooms and so on. So much more potentially, much more widespread. But let's move on uh, and see what other pests that, that we've got here. Uh, so box five, these are pests that we've kind of always had, but they've developed a bit of an ups upsurge, not because of any changes in external factors or changes of behavior, it's because they've evolved resistance. Uh, and the classic one of this would be bed bugs. You know, bed bugs, as we kind of heard already earlier this morning, uh, in most countries, certainly in the UK, they were a low level pest through the 1980s and the 1990s. They were here, absolutely they were here, but they weren't particularly common. And certainly in the hospitality industry, they'd almost been forgotten about by the 1990s. But then uh, they developed resistance to many of the commonly used insecticides and they started to increase really quite rapidly. There was a resurgence, an upsurge in these uh, in bed bugs and they became, they sort of hit the headlines again and they became much more of a problem. This chart at the bottom, maybe, maybe you can't see it, this spans the years from the year 2000 to 2006. So the first six years of this current uh, millennium. And, uh, and you, the, the curve shows the increase in the number of bed bug jobs being carried out in one London local authority. So you can see a steady increase from the year 2000 onwards. And even in the late 1990s, there were indications that bed bugs were starting to increase again. So the appearance of a resistance gene can bring about a change in pest status. So it appears as though we've got a new pest. Uh, we could say almost the same about rodents. You know, we've always had rodents as pests, but the way that they've developed resistance to anticoagulants, as we've heard already, has kept them up there. So box five, is this going to be a box that produces new pests for us in the future? I would say undoubtedly. You know, I would say, yes, we will see resistance appearing in other pests, the same as we did with the bed bugs, and we'll bring those pests back from being marginal problems to being mainline headline uh, pests yet again. And particularly as the range of pesticides available to us decreases, then uh, we will, I think, start to see a growth in resistance problems. Let's move on to box six. So box six is all about external changes. It's not about the pests themselves. It's about external factors changing, uh, climate change being absolutely the most obvious and the most important one. And, and here's our little graph showing how the temperature, global temperatures, average global temperatures have started to increase very steadily since really the middle of the last century, since the 1950s, 1960s. Now, you know, what effect is this going to have on pests? Well, to be honest, I think the way things are going at the moment, it's not going to have so much effect on indoor pests. Um, you know, the stuff that lives inside buildings is buffered anyway with central heating and with insulation. So climate change is not immediately going to have a big effect on indoor pests, but it will affect outdoor pests. And, and you know, a, a warming UK will become attractive to pests that we hadn't formerly had. And we've got examples of that already, that the tree bumblebee, Bombus hypnorum, is this bumblebee that's arrived in the last decade or so from mainland Europe, from more uh, 
uh, southern areas of mainland Europe, moved up into this country. Bum most bumblebees are not a problem. This one's not a serious problem, but it does nest in buildings. It chooses to nest in buildings, which brings it into conflict with people, uh, and often in bird nest boxes, and people worry about, you know, they used to have great tits nesting in their nest box, and now they've got tree bumblebees instead. So that's an example of an insect's move northwards as a result of climate change. The plane tree bug on the right here, this red bug, was first found uh, in London in 2007 and is now widespread in London and in some other cities as well. It lives on plane trees, so it's not an immediate problem, except that come the autumn, it chooses to hibernate in buildings. So just like cluster flies, it finds its way into buildings, sometimes in big numbers, and causes concern with those people. And we could put other pests in here. We could say, what about the ivy bee, which is becoming a local pest in some southern parts of the UK uh, and um, has recently moved up here. We could talk about the garden cockroach, Ectopius vitiventris, that was found in the UK only three or four years ago and now appears to be more widespread than we formerly thought. There's a lot of pests that are uh, drifting northward. And there's staying with climate change, um, box six. You know, there are a number of other pests that we don't have at the moment that could also drift northwards into this country. And I've just picked one here. I've just picked termites. And the map on the left shows you that termites, or one particular species, is a, a very common in the southwest of France, but has been moving northwards for several decades now. It's very common in Paris. Some areas of Paris are very widely affected by this termite. It's continued to move northwards. It's now on the Channel Coast. And, uh, and I kind of suspect it's only a matter of time before this species jumps the channel, uh, particularly as it has a swarming flight uh, at the right time of year, just like our garden ants do, for example. It has a swarming flight, so sooner or later, this is going to cross the channel and uh, move into the UK. And, and of course, if not termites, there's other species as well that will move north. Uh, brown dog tick is a good example. Public Health England is concerned about brown dog tick moving into the UK. The uh, tiger mosquito you'll know about. There are a number of ant species as well that have already started to appear in the UK. And the animal health agency in the UK, I know this year has been running a campaign to try to eradicate acrobat ants that have become established in the UK. So uh, that kind of covers those six boxes. Let's jump back to that original diagram and see where that takes us. So box one, native wildlife, it's always been a pest such as wasps. Will there be more of those? No, they won't. No, they won't. I've just given that like a gray color as one we don't have to worry about anymore. So box two, it's got an orange color. Should we worry about wildlife moving out of the countryside into our cities? Yeah, I think we should be concerned. Um, you know, there will, I'm sure, continue to be a drift of new species, native species that move into uh, urban areas and start to interact negatively with people. Boxes three and four, the released or escaped pests or the classic imported pests, I'm going to say we're done with those. Now, I'm kind of putting my faith on the Wildlife Countryside Act and people having the common sense not to release animals, you know, not even to release their pets that got too big, their boa constrictor or their terrapin or whatever. Hopefully they've got good sense not to release them, but I know some people do. But coming around to the two red boxes, these are the ones that worry me. These are the ones that kind of keep me awake at night. Uh, box five, pests that develop a resistance mutation, just like we saw bed bugs move out of obscurity in the late 1990s in the UK and become headline news in the early 21st century. Other pests could easily follow in that route. Just take, let's take fleas, for example. You know, pet fleas are not a big problem. They used to be more of a problem. Could we see fleas develop resistance to the pesticides that currently used to control them, either the pesticides that we use as pest controllers or the pesticides that are used on pets? And we may well find Fleas, for example, but other ones as well, uh, um, taking on a, a higher status. And then finally, box six, climate change. You know, climate change is going to affect, you know, unless we can do something radical about it, we're all pinning our hopes on the COP conference in Glasgow, 
uh, next month, I think it is. Uh, we're pinning our hopes on that. But in the meanwhile, uh, pests, you know, they don't read the headlines. They will continue to move into our country as it gradually warms. And we will see a variety of insects, whether it's maybe mosquitoes or termites or ticks, taking advantage of, um, of uh, warming UK. So that kind of brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. Uh, we've got a few minutes left, just about. So thank you for your attention. Natalie, do we have any questions? I believe we do. Um, so we uh, would you, why would you classify the IVB as a pest? Well, I classify it as a pest because I get pest controllers phoning me up saying, <laughs> I've got a customer, they've got a, their front lawn or their flower beds has got all these holes drilled in it. And, um, and there's lots and lots of bees coming and going. They don't want their children to play in the garden now because of the bees. What can they do about it? I've had the same with pubs with a beer garden where they've had exactly the same situation with lots and lots of uh, bees burrowing into the lawn in the beer garden guests not wanting to sit outside, which is where, you know, people are encouraged to sit during COVID. And um, so, yeah, uh, but you're right. I think the quest, the, the drift of what you're saying is, is all these wildlife pests? Um, well, you know, it depends where it is. You know, um, a pest is a bit of wildlife that's in the wrong place. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think, you know, so, yeah, there's my answer to that. We've got another one. Yeah, absolutely. So for clove bows, are there any traditional pest species that we have exported, we have exported to other countries and have other countries suffered from imported pests as much as the UK? Yeah, that's a great question, isn't it? That's a great question. We always sit in the UK looking <laughs> outwards. So um, what, what pests have we sent overseas? Um, that, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I tell you what I am going to say for that. I'm going to say... You know, when bed bugs kicked off 20 years ago, early in this millennium, 2000, 2005, that sort of time, if you looked at, you know, a lot of people said, oh, these bed bugs are coming in from other countries. Mm -hmm. And as a fair enough thing to, to suggest. And, uh, but actually, if we looked at most other countries, if we, if we looked at the levels of bed bugs in Germany or France or even Central Europe, Czech Republic was one where I had a lot of contact with with Czech Republic, uh, and indeed in Turkey. Uh, and at the time when our bed bugs were hitting the headlines in, let's say, 2005, and people said they're coming from overseas, if you looked at those other countries, their bed bug bed levels were really low. Uh, and I've got colleagues in Turkey, uh, and I kept asking them, you know, have you got bed bugs? Are they, you know, uh, uh, people say our bed bugs are coming from Turkey, and they say, no, we haven't got bed bugs in Turkey. We do a lot of pest control, but we don't see bed bugs there. But maybe they, you know, then they started to say we, they start to appear in tourist hotels. Uh, 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 and so my, my gut feeling is that in the early 21st millennium, you know, 2000, 2010, 2015, actually, we were exporting resistant bed bugs out the UK to other nearby European countries. At that time, we had far more bed bugs than, than they did. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, doesn't it? Like you say, the statistics are there. And if you look at them uh, in detail, maybe that's what it's saying. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah, good stuff. Um, OK, so Graham Turner here says, surely there must be potential for more, in your category four, indoor pests to come in from other countries that we don't currently have here. For example, textile moths um, and uh, or are we, you know, are these due to global warming? Yeah, uh, I, there's always a bit of potential, but I guess I'm going to say we've had so much trade and movement of goods and movement of people and stuff going backwards and forwards from warm countries for centuries now. Uh, and if they were going to come, they'd be here already. Uh, I'm not saying that we've got every single thing, but I think we've had, you know, that big wave of Victorian warm climate pests, the pharaoh's ants, uh, you know, the German cockroaches, the American cockroaches, the Oriental cockroaches, the Indian meal moth, the tribolium, all these stuff brought in from tropical and semi-tropical countries all appeared in Victorian times. And, and will more stuff come? Uh, you know, th there's other pests that we see. You know, if you look through textbooks of international pests, yeah, sure, there's other pests out there. But if you take, for example, the brown-banded cockroach, you know, that's in those textbooks. It occurs in some other countries. It's a little bit common in some other countries. It has been found in the UK, but it's been drifting in 
for many, many, many years, but it's never, ever got established here. Mm. So, you know, whatever our indoor environment here is and buildings in the UK, it suits some pets, but it doesn't suit others. So I, I, I'm not going to say never, you know, never say never, but I think all the obvious pests that's going to come, we've probably got them. And just that long-tailed silver fish, mm-hmm. um, uh, the grey silver fish, the paper fish, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's one that, you know, was an obvious kind of missing pest that has now completed our suite of classic <laughs> indoor pests. Mm. Absolutely. Um, there's just some comments here about uh, about bed bugs, and I was thinking the same, um, both with with your presentation as well as Sarah's this morning. But in London, you know, having I've worked there, and Ed Fleck, he's also worked there in the mid '90s, and was finding a lot of bed bug problems. And of course, you know, it's a highly populated city, so maybe that's why. But they're certainly finding them even earlier than 2000s in some situations. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I worked on them, you know, back in the late 1990s, and but but there was a time. You know, if you te- talk with hotel chains, absolutely. You know, when I first started working with big hotel chains on bed bugs in the early 2000s, they were saying, we never had this problem. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we look after 300 hotels. We never had bed bugs, you know, for decades. We've, you know, rare, very, 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 very rarely had bed bugs. But mm-hmm. by the time you got to 2005, 2010, boom, you know, it had kicked off. Mm. In, in a big way so yeah there was a love and a dip but i know the, the timing is perhaps slightly different from what we might have heard earlier on this morning but anyway there you go that's it it's all, all to interpretation depending where you're in the country what pest you're dealing with what part of the business if you're in pest control it can vary can't it so yeah um, the records are the records though Natalie. they are they are that's true just like help everyone out you know yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> great well thank you clive there's a couple of questions hanging around in there a few bits about asian hornets and tree bees but if you'd if you'd mind also having a, a little type to those answers those yeah. questions is that all right i'll do that Great, Fantastic. fabulous. As okay. always, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, oh, good to see you all. I know. Thanks, Clive. Take care.